Rachel Laivola is a professor of art and art history and the head of uh, the Department of Creative Arts at the University of Lagos. She has published widely on the visual culture of Africa and here, especially on Nigeria. She has carved a niche for herself in the creative art industry as a distinguished female artist who combines an active studio practice with research. Pechu comes from a strong tradition of art making, taking advantage of her dual heritage in Yoruba and Edo. Her mother, Princess Elizabeth Olowu, daughter of Oba Akenzua II, King of Benin, became, re became, renowned, became renowned as the first female to cast bronze in Nigeria. Pechu works in a variety, or Pechu herself works in a variety of media focusing on both personal and communal histories as it relates to Benin. Her most celebrated projects, Benin1897.com, and the restitution question from 2010, and whose centenary, 2000, a work from 2015, dwell on aspects of the historical implications of authenticity and ownership of Nigerian art. She has a long list of local and international exhibitions. I just want to mention like maybe one project, because we know each other from this project, which was the exhibition uh, boundary objects that was shown in Dresden in 2014 and then uh, closed in Madrid in Spain in 2016. And this was a project that came out of a transnational research and uh, exhibition project called Artificial Facts, uh, where we collaborated. Uh, Peter has also been working as a visiting lecturer in uh, a couple of universities in Nigeria and in the US. And at the moment, and this is also why she can be here today is uh, that she is a resident artist at the Art Academy in Düsseldorf. And yeah, please welcome Pichu with me. Thank you very much for that beautiful introduction. Um, I was speaking about uh, a project I did in 2010, which is titled Benin1897.com and the Benin Contested Patrimony. Earlier on we were told that we shouldn't uh, restrict the description of some of the cultural and sacred objects we find in uh, Western museums to objects because they have a lot of meaning, they're imbued with a lot of meaning. Now we, okay. We'll be discussing Benin, um, which is in the southern part of Nigeria and it should not be confused with uh, Benin, the country, uh, which is to the west of Nigeria. It was an empire ruled by the king known as the Oba. Benin was attacked by British forces in 1897, and about 4,000 pieces of bronze, ivory, and other valuable sacred objects in different media were cut away by British soldiers. This episode remains one of the most documented instances of looting that went on during the colonial era in Africa. The soldiers took inventory of the works that were looted and they also kept some very exotic pieces for themselves. The others were um, sold off once they arrived in, the, in uh, England to offset the cost of the expedition. And although Benin was not a German colony, uh, when the works arrived in the UK, um, the Germans bought, uh, knowingly bought a lot of these looted artifacts. And that's how they found their way into different parts, different museums uh, in Germany. Now, here we have the photographs of the Oba of Benin, who was on the throne of Borame, in shackles, a once powerful king who held sway in the old Benin Empire and beyond, sitting aboard a ship that took him on exile to Calabar, as well as British soldiers on the other side in the midst of their loot, as constant reminders of this sad historical event. 120 years since this event occurred, reference is still made to it as if it happened a few years ago. This wanton stealing of these Benin objects is one example of how Africa as a continent has been stripped of its treasures during the colonial era. Benin bronzes have continually been embroiled in the debate over ownership, the display of these objects in Western museums and restitution. These objects were made as records of court activities. 
they were sacred objects and historical records and were not made to be displayed as they appear today in Western museums. When Europeans view these works in their museums, they must remember that they were not simply removed or taken away, as is often reported. The works were violently yanked off sacred altars and uh, the bedchamber of the king was ransacked. British soldiers opened fire, and that's the record, that the British soldiers opened fire on the Benin defenders who fell like nuts from trees. And you will recall that the soldiers had very sophisticated uh, weapons, while the Edo um, defenders had the bow and arrow, so they had to close very, come very close to their targets. And so when they came on trees to uh, shoot at the soldiers, they just opened fire on them and they dropped like fruits, like ripe fruits from the trees. And that is the context of the removal of Benin uh, work. So when Benedict Savoy talks about the emphasizing on the artistry of the objects uh, and to play up provenance, uh, she makes a good point in wanting to know, and I quote, how much blood is dripping from a piece of art. Benin objects do not belong to an extant tradition or culture. It belongs to a living culture. The traditions and social practices for which these objects were made still exist. For example, I've shown you two photographs here, and um, the one with um, the king uh, about Eridawa, um, the past king of Benin, about Eridawa uh, the first. And the other is the uh, recent king, the king on the throne. Um, you can see them wearing very similar um, costumes. That's the most prized costume of the king. Uh, one during ceremonial occasions, like the coronation. This photograph was taken of the uh, king on the throne, Oba Ewai II, on the day of his coronation, which was exactly a year ago. Now, these are items of regalia. Even the British took items of regalia of Oba Vorame when he was exiled to Calabar. And they, this regalia and bronze objects still are used uh, today as of old. I was raised in Benin City, a culture that takes so much pride in its art. And I feel a great commitment to give back to a culture that gave me nurture. My artistic contribution became more pronounced after my involvement with the exhibition project uh, in 2007 titled Benin Kings and Rituals. I was um, invited to, give, to write a paper for the book and also um, give description to some of the objects that were in that show. And in 2009, when the exhibition closed in Chicago, I gave the lecture at the Art Institute of Chicago. And remember that there were a lot of protests when the exhibition was gonna move from uh, Vienna to Chicago. It moved from Vienna to Paris and Berlin before it ended up in Chicago. So after I came back from that um, exhibition, I felt the need to, um, to respond in a way and using my art as a means of uh, doing that. I began to think about, more seriously about using the archive, using the stories of Benin to tell my own story. So I began to look at the impact of on identity. What does it mean as a Nigerian, as an artist, as a member of the royal family, as an art historian to tell about my story, about my culture from the outside? And very often we find a lot of text, a lot of catalogs of Benin works that we have to you know, look through that come from the outside. What does it also mean for me to pay for the images, um, for copyright of objects that were taken away from my great grandfather's bed chamber? Um, these are issues that you know, give us so much pain. So my artistic engagement focused on reactions to the lost objects of Benin with a solo exhibition and co-edited volume titled Benin1897.com, Art and the Restitution Question in 2010. That's a catalog from the um, exhibition that held in Vienna. And for the first time, I was seeing a lot of the works that were taken in 1897. The brothers of the king of Benin, about Eridawa II, was still on the throne at the time, were also at this exhibition, and they talked with so much pain and nostalgia 
about seeing these works um, for the first time. So what does 1897mean.com mean? Benin was a venue. 1897, the date, and .com, like the domain name, .commercial, refers to the fact that Benin was sacked because Oba restricted the British from controlling trade in the region. And .com also refers to the co-modification of Benin objects, which is still very much the order of the day. Benin objects show up at auctions, attracting huge prices. Objects which was first sold for a few pounds to offset the cost of the expedition now command prices like 4.5 million pounds on the international market without recourse to the owners. The accompanying text was a co-edited volume. And for me, it was important to bring African scholars to present their thoughts on Benin contested patrimony. For very long, we've heard so much coming from the West. We had not heard a lot about those who actually feel very strongly about the return of Benin objects. And in this book, which is about 225 pages, I also included a rich, rich um, list of uh, appendices showing the letters written by the Oba of Benin and members of the Edo Royal family, government officials of cultural institutions requesting for the return of Benin objects. And some of the scholars are here, some we can identify very easily, like Kwame Okboku, who is one of the greatest advocates for the return of um, stolen objects, looted objects to countries of origin. And the foreword was written by Oba Vorame the first, the Oba of Benin, and um, it also shows some of the letters um, as part of the appendices. And in the catalog, in the Vienna show, the Oba clearly stated in the foreword, and I quote, it is our prayer that the people and the government of Austria will show humaneness and magnanimity and return to us some of these objects which found their way to their country. It was important for me to show this exhibition of installations in two um, universities. It was important to show in the university so we could have very scholarly debates about the whole issue of um, contested patrimony. And this is one of the works, uh, an installation of 1,000 heads. Um, it is said that in the history books, you find that Benin works that were cut away, there's no exact number. Sometimes you read about 3,000 works, sometimes 4,000. But I did 1,000 heads in more inferior material. I, work, I worked with terracotta. But the works that were taken were largely bronze heads. And these were the heads, ancestral heads, that were used to commemorate past kings. Um, so, I also had metal foil worked into some of them to give the semblance of bronze, and I had 1897 written down as a shattered plaque. And indeed, the entire country was, uh, the entire area or the region was in disarray when the British came in. They burnt every city that they came in contact with as they made their way into Benin to the palace of the king where they cut away the treasures. So that's the installation. Uh, in the gallery space, 1,000 works covered the entire gallery space. That was huge. So on a ratio of one to four, we had such a colossal number for people to contend with. So they had an idea of the scale of removal of these objects. A close up of some of the heads. Now, when the British soldiers got into the palace, um, they lay siege. And on the third day, um, they set the place ablaze. Um, some of the ivories, in the museum actually have some of the bone marks. So beyond asking for the works to be returned, um, we also know that some of the works were damaged in this fire and some still show signs of these um, markings on them. So here I was trying to introduce some of the oxides, black oxides on the fire terracotta heads which form part of the installation. Another work titled Theater of War um, was a way of writing back. It was, I looked at the archives, the, the writings of the soldiers, how they um, wrote commands um, to the home office about bringing in soldiers that had knowledge of um, native warfare, the amount of ammunition that were expended on a single day, the kind of ammunition that were expended, uh, the cities that were burnt down, the villages that were burnt down, 
and how the queen rejoiced at the end of this whole saga. So that is a huge installation um, where all of this was written down and strung together. Um, another installation that looks at um, you know, the number of years that had elapsed since 1897 to 2010, showing <coughs> the um, calabashes taken away from the ritual context of the calabash and using symbols that are associated with the king on each calabash, each calabash or god representing a year since the expedition. 17 of those gods were left plain uh, to represent the 17 years, the period of interregnum, when the king was exiled to Calabar, where there was no king on the throne of Benin, which had never happened before. Following from our exhibition, we had a number of artists who were also very interested in engaging with this theme. And one of my students, uh, Jimo Ganiyu, did a series of um, cartoons, which I found very interesting. And uh, he did this one, and then another one, um, which was directly connected to the brochure of the um, Vienna show of 2007. But I'd like to say here that a lot of artists have engaged, a lot of artists before my time had engaged in um, looking at the 1897 event. It is a theme that is so present in the mind of Nigerian artists. We've had a lot of playwrights, a lot of writers, and while I was doing my work, I came in contact with a Nigerian-based, uh, a Belgian-based Nigerian, uh, Monday Midnight, um, who did the 1897 track, which you can find on YouTube um, on this event. And uh, more recently, we have Invasion 1897, a movie by Iman Sue Lancelot. We have a British-based Nigerian artist, Leo Asemota, who also looks at the theme. Jimo Ganiyu, the cartoonist. Uh, we also know of Yinka Shonebare, who had also shown um, a series of works, a Scramble for Africa, who looks at how Africa was, the map of Africa was put on the table during the Berlin Conference and how it was um, divided. So um, we also have Olesha Inka's uh, impute, um, the Nobel Laureate, who looked at how to reclaim uh, one of the heads that was taken away, um, and such other uh, artistic um, um, works that have emerged um, from this whole um, idea of representing 1897. For me, it was important to do this project because we needed to give further information about this to the Nigerian public, um, to inform them about what had transpired and also get a feedback from what they thought about it. And interestingly, in 2014, Adrian Mark Walker, the son of Richard Sutherland Walker, and the grandson of Captain Walker, who was a spy attached to the British forces, um, came to Benin. He actually had two works returned to the Oba of Benin. And he said that he coveted those two works so much as a young boy, seeing them on the cabinet of his uh, grandparents. So when his mother died, he inherited the sculptures. And he felt that if he could covet them so much as an outsider, he wondered how those who actually owned these works would feel. And so he decided to bring the works to Benin himself. And I tell you that the entire city was agog with celebration. The Oba of Benin um, sent out cards to people to attend. There were canopies. There was, it was a big party to receive him. And this was the presentation done in the palace. Uh, returning two works, one was the Bed of Prophecy, um, a bronze um, idiophone, and the other one, a gong, were given to the king, and the king was extremely happy about it. Adrian said, and I quote, we need to persuade not just the British public, but the international community that it is unethical and immor immoral to be holding on to items which are not legally acquired, end of quote. That is the card, inviting people to the event. And um, here you can see all the cameras trying to capture this very interesting event, this very epochal event of the return of two sculptures uh, in private collection. Uh, when Roxley was talking, he talked about the fact that um, he's very worried about the collections in private, collection, in, in private hands 
uh, about his own culture. But here is the reverse. The public institutions are the ones keeping the million works. The private collectors are bringing, or private, those in private collections are being returned um, to Benin. In the 1930s, the item of regalia, which was in the private collection, uh, was returned to Oba Kenzo II, my grandfather. Uh, and he, they said he danced for joy when he received those items of regalia. But there's a problem with the works that remain in public um, institutions. So he also said that he believes the international community is guilty of double standards with regards to such artifacts. When, for example, at the end of Second World War, um, the Second World War, looted works of art were discovered in Nazi home. We went through a great deal of trouble to return them to the families from which they had come. I cannot understand what the difference is between Nazi and looted objects of Benin. If you ask the British Museum, they will say, well, they are only custodians. If you ask British politicians, they say, it is the business of the British Museum. So we go around in a circle. In conclusion, I would just like to say something about the Humboldt Forum. And just before I came, I spoke with um, the uh, younger brother of about the past king of Benin, about Eridawa the um, first. And he had not heard anything about the Humboldt Forum. He had not been informed. The palace had not been informed about the movement of um, Benin objects from Dalem to uh, the palace here. And I'd like to say that the Humboldt Forum, in its grandiose structure of housing Benin bronzes relocated from Dalem, like the so-called Universal Museums, ignores requests for the return of Benin objects looted in 1897. If anything, it reinforces the idea of the continued keeping of the looted Benin objects acquired at the close of the 20th century. The movement of Benin objects situates the collection within the confines and grip of another Western institution, an institution or museum that continually redefines itself as a place where objects can best be appreciated far away from the domain where they were created, commissioned, paid for by the king, and where they were imbued with cultural meaning. For several centuries, these works remained in the palace before they were carted away in one clean sweep by British soldiers. Moving the objects from one location to another is a clear indication that irrespective of what the owners feel about their art, the objects in Western collection can be sold at will at auctions, moved from place to place, duplicated, photographed, donated without recourse to the Oba of Benin, whose heirloom it was that was looted from the palace. There's an urgent need to change this narrative. Thank you very much. <laughs>